<laughs> feels weird. What does? Being outside, it, it's been... What, what day is it? Well, it's past 2 a.m., so it's January 16th. Almost two weeks. Told you. It's just... didn't feel real. <laughs> You're gonna get in trouble for this, aren't you? They'll forgive me when we find the words. <laughs> you know, for you guys being the Supernatural Investigation Division, you don't really seem to do much. Say hello to one of, if not the least, funded divisions in the FBI. Remember, I was shocked when Ariadne told you about us. The public isn't exactly... aware. So why have it in the first place, besides idiots like me, you know, sending stuff in? Because some higher-ups believed in the stuff. They allowed it to be created, but no effort was put into it except to throw people like me in. People like you? We really should listen to Felix's recording now. <sighs> You're gonna tell me eventually. You owe me that much for all this. It's only fair. We'll see. Okay. What have you got for us, Felix? Welcome to the Beating Heartland, created by Denver Bauman. Episode 17, The Factory. Yes, got it working. Finally charged enough, piece of crap. Okay. Hi, Denver. I didn't really think about how to start this. I'm with Ariadne. Say hi. Really? Well, she's driving and grumpy. I'm worried, all right? She's worried. Maybe I should start over. Give me that. Denver, if you get this, we're currently driving somewhere to hide because of... Well, I'll let Felix explain. We can't tell you where we are going in case they get a hold of this recording somehow. It's not really a great way of secret communication. Very easy to get a hold of. Also, the FBI might listen. Oh, which reminds me. We know you're being held by the FBI. The SID, to be exact. Yeah, them. I got into their... Well, in layman's terms, I hacked their computer and found the information on you. Felix, maybe don't... Ariadne had a hunch, and I followed it. We were right. How did he- Don't underestimate him. It's a little annoying, actually. He doesn't really know boundaries. It's also a crime. <laughs> you can be sure to tell him that. Anyway, continuing on. It's kind of strange that this division picked you up. Also, they found you really fast. Sloppy. Can we not discuss the sloppiness of his killing? But, fine. Anyway, our boss had a security camera at the front door, so you were seen entering and exiting at the time of death. He was discovered the next day when he didn't show up to the station. Why were you guys called to get me? We weren't. The police were called. Simple murder really doesn't fall under our jurisdiction most of the time. So... I convinced my superiors to let us handle it. The police made a fuss. They don't get enough excitement around here. We took over and found you at your apartment. Sitting in the middle, basically comatose. Brought you in. What about the heads? And Michelle? Nowhere to be seen. Really? Yep. Everything in the house was completely normal, except for the body of your boss next to the pool table. So they cleaned everything except his body? Wouldn't you? Hide the evidence except for what is incriminating for someone else? I guess. Let's keep listening. <sighs> okay. I learned about his death on the 3rd. So he didn't show up to work the day before, and with your absence on top of that, people just started talking. The police hadn't wanted to announce it so soon, active investigation and all, but enough people hounded them that they made an official statement that he had been murdered. Rumors started flying that you were the one that killed him. I didn't think that sounded like you, so I went to your apartment. I had to make sure you were okay. I also wanted to know if you'd read the stuff I gave you at Flipping Patties. It's relevant to the rest of, well, the rest of this. I just asked because you never brought it up. Not that you'd really been at work since we talked. I hope my stuff wasn't what caused you to- It wasn't. Wait, how do you know? He had a session with me. It wasn't you that set him over the edge. You sure you can't just tell me about your therapy sessions? 
No, I still have a modicum of respect, and patient confidentiality is airtight. Continue the story, Felix. Fine. It, is that car following us? Focus. You'd already left your apartment. The door was unlocked. Well, actually was smashed open. The wood splintered. To be honest, I thought you'd been murdered too. At least I hoped so. Felix! Sorry, came out wrong. Of course I didn't want you dead, Denver. I, I just mean, in, instead of being responsible for killing our boss, I mean, I'm sure you killed him for a good reason. I mean, after everything I've seen. Which you still haven't said. Right, sorry. I didn't want to tell you this twice. Where was I? Went to your place. There wasn't a sign of a struggle besides the broken door, so I decided to rule out that you were murdered. I had no idea where you actually were. Not until I met up with Ariadne. But that didn't happen until a few days later. I went back to my apartment and began researching our boss, trying to figure out why someone would kill him. He had become head of the radio station back in 2013 after the charred remains of his predecessor were found among nine other bodies in the small town of Shannon. Apparently, they'd been found by two local boys, one by the name of Denver. Surprise, surprise. Denver told me about that one. Well, the police ruled it a serial killing, but seemed to quickly drop the case due to insufficient evidence. I tried to go further back into his life. It wasn't easy, and realized I didn't know his name. I had to rely on newspaper articles and blogs focused on the radio station until I was able to find a small snippet that had his name. It was... huh. Anyway, b before 2013, there weren't any records of him. And, I mean, there were none. It was like, in 2013, he just popped into existence. I had researched all night. It's not the first time that's happened, and I couldn't just sit there and continue researching. My stomach was growling. So after a quick look in the fridge, I discovered I had nothing to eat. So I went to the grocery store. Is this relevant? Actually, yes. I'll spare the details. All you need to know is that I saw Rachel Tanner again. Who is Rachel? She's the nurse who told me about what was happening at the hospital. After which I saw her disemboweled. I told you about this a few days ago, right? Uh, yes. Well, to my surprise, I saw her again at the store. This was the second time now. She looked normal. I didn't talk to her, couldn't bring myself to, but I followed her instead. Much safer. That's what I... Oh, uh, sarcasm? Yep. Uh, she was odd. She didn't have any of the quirks of the Rachel I'd met. She was almost too well-mannered, like Ariadne. But even more bland. Hmm. Rachel just went about her normal day, went to the store to buy milk, eggs, juice, and bread, the blandest shopping list in existence. Then she drove to the park. I almost lost her on the road, I was tailing too far behind. When she got to the park, she did yoga. It's January. It's cold, not freezing, but it was still just really uncomfortable to be out. There's more to her day, but trust me, it was boring. Too boring, in a way that no one actually acts. Like an NPC in a video game, going about their fixed schedule. I decided to test a theory. It was a long shot, but I was right. I went to the store the next day, same time, about 9am, and there she was. Every single thing she did was the same. And I don't mean similar, it was the exact same, down to like the movements and the pace. It was like this from January 4th until the 8th. You followed her for five days? Yes. Okay, that sounds obsessive, doesn't it? I went to work, so it was mostly mornings. Well, her evening schedule was just as dull. Dinner, TV, then bed. When she watched TV, it was like she went into a trance, not blinking or laughing at any jokes. But on January 8th, things got more exciting. Terrifying. Her schedule changed? She didn't go to the store. I waited for an hour, but she never showed up. So I went to her house. Sure enough, she was still home. But she wasn't alone. There was a man with her. He was around her age, with slightly graying hair, a short beard, and a little bit of a pot belly. He was sitting in the living room, grinning like an idiot. He was obviously attracted to her. I, I couldn't see Rachel through the window, but the man was talking enthusiastically. He seemed to be bragging and trying to impress her. But then, his smile disappeared. His eyes widened and his mouth hung open. I heard a scream. He tried to stand. 
Rachel entered my view through the window. She pinned him down against the couch, holding him with a strength that didn't make sense for her size. He was cursing at her, demanding her to stop, begging and crying, and he was doing everything he could to escape. She picked up a wine bottle and smashed it over his head. The screaming came to an abrupt stop. Rachel stretched. I I could hear the popping of joints from outside. Rachel picked him up and tossed him over her shoulder. She walked in the direction of the garage, so I ran to my car. I didn't want to lose her. And sure enough, after a few minutes, her car pulled out of the driveway. I followed her as she drove to the other side of Rockford. It wasn't easy. I almost lost her a couple times. She was driving way too fast. Then we got to a part of the city I didn't know existed. I'd be surprised if anyone did except for teens or drug addicts. It was a large area filled with really big metal buildings, rusted and riddled with holes, and from the signs they used to be factories. Rachel parked near one of the factory buildings, and I noticed that her car wasn't alone. There were dozens of vehicles, and I could tell they just got there. Rachel got out of her car and pulled the man from the trunk. She carried him inside. His body was just flopping on her shoulder. Don't tell me you followed. Of course not. That would have been stupid. I found a fire escape on the outside of the building that led to an office area on the second floor. Not everything had been gutted out of the office space. Cubicles with equipment and files were just thrown all over the place. Random graffiti. It felt like an apocalypse film. Then I heard shuffling coming from the factory floor. I got out of the office and found myself on a metal overlook. I hid behind a few crates. I had been right about more people being here besides Rachel. There were a couple dozen. They were all standing in perfect rows. Like you see in military footage. Except none of these people were in uniform. Just in regular everyday clothes. Rachel was not in this crowd yet. I noticed her near the front. She dropped the body onto a pile. I didn't realize it at first. It was hard to see from my vantage point. But someone shifted. That pile was all unconscious people, and they were all bound and gagged. Rachel joined the group, standing in perfect rows. Minutes passed of nothing. Just dozens of people standing there looking at the unconscious pile of bodies in front of them. I noticed they were all breathing at the same time, in perfect rhythm with each other. Eventually, the pile of bodies stirred as the people who had been there the longest regained consciousness. There was a frantic noise and shuffling as the pile of bodies tried to free themselves. Once all the people seemed to be awake, the rows of the people watching began to laugh. They laughed in unison. Then they all stopped at the same time and spoke. You all did well. This new crop will prove effective. Gather them up in three groups. Find which of them will be locked away for later. The others will use them soon. As for the rest, you know what to do, good puppets. Their voices were perfectly in sync. Every breath, every noise, every twitch, it was exactly the same. Through the noise, I heard something else. I looked around and saw another metal overlook on the other side of the building. A large window set in the wall. Inside, I saw a shadowed figure standing and observing, commanding their every muscle. The term they used at the end, good puppets, it made me think of the hospital and the bodies hanging from the ceiling. But the doctor had died. His body had been found and had been buried. So who was this? The people, the puppets, began to divide up the bound individuals into groups. I heard a large metal door unlocked and I could kind of see the people getting shoved inside. After a careful inspection, the other group was led outside to the cars. The last group was left lying on the factory floor. At that moment, a feeling flooded my head. Why not join the puppets? It would be easier. No thoughts. So much easier for someone else to think for me and tell me what to do every day. Like a factory worker, repeating the same steps hour after hour. And that feeling was intense. It clouded everything else. Then the feeling in the room shifted. Hunger. And suddenly the puppets lashed out at the remaining bound individuals on the floor. It was awful. 
the mass of bodies attacked, ripping at the people on the ground. Their skin bubbled, peeled, bled, and oozed as each body fused with the ones next to it. Instead of a large group of people, they congealed into one fleshy, broiling mass. It churned in a pile of skin, hair, teeth, muscles, bones, and intestines that devoured the remains of these people. Despite what I saw, the, the itching feeling to join them was still just... It was tearing at me. And then the bodies reformed, slowly collecting their parts from the pile of flesh. I saw Rachel's face emerge from the skin, teeth falling back into place, her eyeballs refilling her empty sockets. Her hands reached out to pull herself away from the puddle of skin. She stood up, stretched, and walked away. The others collected themselves and filed out as if they'd just had an ordinary meeting. The shadowy figure in the window continued to watch but didn't say anything else. Except all the people were humming, a slow, content hum like they were full. Once everyone was gone, the figure in the window skulked away and I couldn't see him anymore. The only noise was those people behind the door, frantic and muffled, waiting for whatever their fate was. I couldn't move. Not for hours. I was in shock. Whether it was my aching legs or the pounding in my head, I finally left. I got back in my car and drove back to my apartment. I went about the routine for a couple days. Breakfast, work, dinner, sleep. On January 11th, I finally snapped out of it. Got in my car and drove. Anything to just mix it up. Didn't want to become like them. Didn't know where I was going, I just drove. Hoped that something would come to me. And it did. I thought about my meeting with you, Denver, at Flipping Patties and how you believed in the crazy stuff that was happening. But I didn't know where you were. So I called Ariadne. It was just an impulse. I decided to contact the one person who knew the most about you and maybe knew where you were. I told her I was coming over to talk about you, what happened to you, and me, as much as I knew. I don't think I made much sense. You did not. Well, I didn't go straight to her place. I went back to Rachel's house. It was stupid, I get it. I walked straight up and knocked on her front door. She answered a moment later. She looked normal again. You would never guess that just a few days ago she'd been part of... Well, that. She stared at me, confused. I'm sorry, I don't need anything. She began to shut the door, and I reached out to stop her. My hand brushed against her arm, and it stuck. I felt pain and ecstasy all at once as my hand started to sink into her arm. The skin on her arm bubbled around my hand as it sunk in deeper. Memories flashed through my brain. Being raised as a young girl, going to medical school, and getting my first nursing position. Then my memories started to intermingle. Growing up, one of seven kids, noisy dinner table, always being forgotten, trying to be seen by my parents. My actual vision was gone, replaced entirely by visions of the past. But then I thought about the doctor, meat puppets hanging in the hospital. And then I thought about my boss, his face, imagined him dead in his house. Suddenly I was pulled into another memory, one of Rachel's. Outside of the visions, I could tell that we'd both collapsed to the ground and our bodies were continuing to fuse together. I was Rachel. I was seeing through her eyes. I wasn't able to move except for what the vision demanded, but it felt so real. I, I was in the woods. I looked down and was holding someone, bound and gagged, a woman. I kept her in place with a surprisingly strong grip. I looked back up and saw that we weren't alone. There were ten of them, all standing in a circle, bathed in a red light that didn't seem to have a source. The light filled the area, making the details hard to see. I couldn't see the faces of the individuals standing in the circle. They seemed to be bathed in an impossible shadow. I, I don't know if it was how they actually looked or just Rachel's faulty memory. In the center, there was an 11th individual. 
He was lying on a long wooden slab that seemed to grow out of the ground, branches twisting around his body in an intricate, almost beautiful pattern. I recognized the mustache, the perfect short hair, our boss. He was dead, with several stab wounds through his chest. The ten hummed a low melody that shook the trees. And there was something else there, but I couldn't see it. It moved through the trees, whispered things to each of them I couldn't or wasn't allowed to hear. And that humming became chanting. It grew loud as the ten screamed their chants. I I heard a soft voice in my ears. The voice of the figure from the factory. Puppet. Hand us the sacrifice. I did. No questions, no hesitation. I brought the body to the stump. Two branches reached from the ground and stabbed through the girl's body, and she was lifted off the ground, hanging limply in the air. She wasn't dead. She screamed in pain. They laughed and sighed in pleasure from her screams. Then her skin burst into flame. It was over in a few seconds. All that was left was a charred and blackened body. The corpse of our boss began to bubble on the wooden slab, similar to the puppets in the factory, but this one had more intensity and purpose. His features shifted, his hair grew longer, his mustache fell off, and his body moved and changed. I blinked, and a woman was now lying on the wooden slab. The branches around her moved out of the way as she sat up. She yawned and smiled at the other ten, and spoke with a deep, tired voice. This body will do. I know what my next task will be. I return to where it all began. She reached her hands out to one of the ten, who took it and kissed it gently. The help is appreciated. My persuasiveness has dulled with age. Her eyes darkened. Too many are starting to remember. Another one of them stepped forward, his voice hoarse, more animalistic. I will sniff them out and tear them apart. One of them turned to look at me, and when our eyes met, the vision faded. I was back on the floor of Rachel's home. I had a searing headache, but I stood up. I glanced down, and Rachel was lying there unconscious. My hand was fine, like nothing had happened. I ran. That's a lot. (laughs) Huh. Tell me about it. I went directly to Ariadne's place after. No wonder you were so scattered when you arrived. So, yeah, I filled Ariadne in on, well... Me, the hospital, all that stuff. I didn't tell her anything about the factory or what happened after that. I haven't had time to process it. I don't think I could tell this again. Also, we both got too busy looking into things. There's a lot of material to cover. I I can already tell. The memory's fading. Are you sure we aren't being followed? Focus, Felix. Easy for you to say. Tell him what happened between the 11th and now. Well, it's mostly my fault for taking so long. I filled Ariadne in on everything I knew about our boss, and that you were the one that probably killed him. I assured her it was probably for a good reason. I still don't know the whole story, other than that he's in a terrifying monster cult. We decided to put our heads together to try to make sense of all this. I've been reviewing our sessions for the past few days. There's a lot of material to cover. I decided to look into the radio show. I went back to the station and was able to retrieve a lot of the archived audio. It might not be as direct as what's happened to you, but if there are similarities between your experiences with Ariadne and the radio show, it can only help. It also took me a few days to hack into SID's records to see if they had you. I also found the footage of you entering and leaving our boss's house. Between that and their documents, I was able to confirm you were the only one who could have killed him. I really hope they're working with you to figure this out and not just leaving you in a cell to rot. I wish I could get all the information you gave them, but they haven't put it in the system yet, or decided not to. While we were doing all of this over the last couple days, I felt this itching 
It was like the feeling I had in the factory to just go numb. I noticed people staring at me more than usual. Even when I was in the car, people would stop and stare at me as I drove past. Then, just two days ago, I looked out the window and saw someone staring at my apartment. He wasn't moving, just staring. The next day, someone kept knocking at my door. It sounded like they wanted to break it down. I had been busy listening to the radio show, so I hadn't heard it at first. But I snuck out my back window and got out of there. I went to Ariadne's. Sorry. Sorry? For dragging you into this. You didn't. I've been a part of this since my first vision. Yeah, well, they followed me to Ariadne's. We left, and we've been driving for hours, trying to find somewhere out of the way enough to keep researching for a few days. I was nervous about sending this message to you. I was hoping we'd be able to find you, but SID doesn't have your location anywhere. Smart. Anyway, with the memories fading, I needed to tell you quick. Whoa, 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 watch out! Crap! The Beating Heartland was written by Denver Bauman. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on whatever streaming platform you are using. Follow us online at The Beating Heartland. Thank you for listening. <laughs>